Throughout human history, religious faith has been a source of both comfort and community, but it has also been a source of control where government leaders have cynically used religious faith of the people to support their claim to power. At the same time, certain religious groups have turned to the power of civil authority to suppress their critics and competing ideas by force. In the Middle Ages, throughout most of Western Europe, the Catholic Church, combined with the power of the Holy Roman Empire, held dominance. Yet in 1517, new modes of communication had paved the path for societal transformation when Martin Luther took the dangerous move of posting 95 theses, or criticisms, of the Catholic Church, an act that sparked the Protestant Reformation in Germany. One place that his ideas were having an effect was in Zurich, Switzerland. Mennonite historian John Ruth explains. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, there was a man named Ulrich Singley, who was a farm boy from eastern uh, Switzerland, and basically he was a chaplain for, the Swiss had the best soldiers. Everybody wanted to hire them. And he was a chaplain for them and there was a very bloody defeat. Anyway, the business class of the city of Zurich in northern Switzerland heard about him. And they invited him up to the town of Zurich. And he began preaching. And he was a minor genius. He could play any musical instrument. He knew languages, he had studied under Erasmus, and he began preaching with a new spirit in Zurich, a town of 7,000 in Zurich. Uh, has a wall around it with about 13 towers and seven gates and all, a typical late med medieval city. And he's in the big church, it's called the Grossminster, that's the German word for big church. And he, instead of turning back toward the crucifix and saying, hoc es corpus meum, this is my body, he turns toward the congregation, he opens the Greek New Testament, which he knows cold, and he starts with Matthew, and he says, now whatever I get to, I'm going to preach. Well, within four chapters, you're in the Berg Predigt, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I mean, it was a sensation. They said, let's go for it. This is not church tradition. Mm -hmm. Now, among his followers, the hangers-on, was a younger group of guys that got together and uh, talked and knew their Hebrew and their Greek. And one guy in particular was Conrad Grebel. I think I've got a picture of him here my son drew there, <laughs> based on a picture from Zurich. Anyway, they got together. So essentially, this younger group, they began to break with the older patterns. Mm -hmm. They began to question what was the mass about? Why don't you eat meat on certain days and all those things? And they even said, what's this business of, of baptizing babies? I don't know what's going on. Zwingli and his followers were weighing practices and teachings of the church against what they saw in the Bible. And where the two differed, they threw out the tradition in favor of what they saw in Scripture. But Zwingli had been a military chaplain. He knew about power and the backlash that could come from Rome. So very practically, he had put himself and his followers under the protection of the local civil authorities. The town council did not care that much about theology, but they were more than happy to have a local church that everyone would be a part of from birth and that was under their control rather than the control of Rome. A younger group pretty soon began to be dissatisfied with Zwingli because they said, you've turned us on to the word and these are our ideas. He said, we we got to keep on baptizing babies because we, you can only go as fast as the town council will let you go. And basically, this younger group says, well, who's in charge here? Are we going to reform the church? Are, who are we looking to? What works? So essentially, <clears throat> uh, they they wouldn't baptize their babies. And then the, then came the crunch. And the, the uh, Zwingli leagued with the town council, uh, said, you either do that or you're in trouble. The group led by Conrad Grable were pushing for believers' baptism. They saw baptism as a symbol of a voluntary break with an old way of life and commitment to a new faith rather than merely a step that happened to all citizens in infancy. 
Zwingli and this group had a couple public debates, each trying to win the other over to their thinking. But after a second one, Zwingli cut it off. On January 23rd, 1525, the town council expelled the group from the church and told them to leave Zurich or be arrested. That night, the group gathered in the home of one of the original three leaders, Felix Mons. George H. Williams, in his book, The Radical Reformation, quotes how one of the other leaders, George Blaurock, remembers that night. It came to pass that they were together until fear began to come over them. Yea, they were oppressed in their hearts. Thereupon they began to bow their knees to the Most High God in heaven, and called upon him as the knower of hearts, implored him to enable them to do his divine will and to manifest his mercy towards them. For flesh and blood and human forwardness did not drive them, since they well knew what they would have to bear and suffer on account of it. After the prayer, George Blaurock arose and asked Conrad to baptize him for the sake of God with the true Christian baptism upon his faith and knowledge. And when he knelt down, Conrad baptized him. After that was done, the others similarly desired George to baptize them, which he also did upon their request. Although the group simply called themselves Christians or brothers, other names began to be assigned them. When they didn't baptize children, when they baptized adults, they were, uh, uh, a heretical term was applied to them. You are rebaptizers, Anabaptist in Greek. I mean, that's the same in, in German, it's Wiedertäufer, rebaptized. They said, we're not rebaptizing. We don't call that baptism what you did to a baby anyway. Mm. We're just getting baptized. Yeah. Okay, well then you're Teufer, you're Baptists, you are heretics, and basically you are, uh, uh, you are uh, uh, treasonous to society. So uh, a minority group grew, and had that not happened, had that line not been crossed, I would have never been born and never would have been such a people. Yet baptism was just the outward symbol of the change in perspective and way of life that this group was called to. They took very literally the words of Jesus when he said, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. In obedience to these words, they refused to be compelled by friend or government official to swear an oath, but rather would simply state the truth and live by it. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In obedience to these words, they made a commitment to return good for evil in their personal life and not be compelled to bear the sword by government. Conrad Rebel wrote to the guy that was leading the Peasants' Revolt. I don't know if you ever heard of the Peasants' Revolt. The Bauern Aufruhr, that you would say in German. Thomas Münzer who is basically leading a social revolution, saying, look, the farmers in the fields are working to the bone. They're on starvation wages, and they have to send half of it to the king. Jesus had talked about the people that wear fine clothes, and he says, it's the poor that will inherit the earth. Conrad Grebel wrote a fan letter to this guy. He says, go for it, man. You're on the right side of things. The society is rigged so that the poor can barely make it and the rich have more than they need. But he said, by the way, he said, I hear uh, you're, you're expecting to overthrow the authorities with the use of the sword. He said, by the way, we don't use the sword. He said, Christians don't kill anymore. The persecution that they knew would come arrived within a month of their baptism. 
Multiple times they were imprisoned, but each time they went right back to preaching. Those who were expelled from the territory only spread the movement further throughout Zurich, Basel, Bern, Germany, and Austria. Within two years, the punishment increased from imprisonment and banishment to torture and public execution, beginning with Felix Mons. The execution of Mons took place on the day he was condemned, 5th of January, 1527. He went to his death with courage. As he walked from the fish market to the river, he praised God, while his mother and brother waited along the way to encourage him to remain steadfast. He was trussed with a stick thrust between his roped, doubled-up legs and arms. And as he was being drawn into the icy water, he sang, In manus tuos domine commendo spiritum meum, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. <laughs> 